Uh, good afternoon. My name is Craig Greenman. Um, I'm one of the uh, new internal medicine doctors in the internal medicine clinic uh, upstairs. Uh, <clears throat> so the talk for today is uh, titled An Ounce of Prevention. It's a, kind of, of a rapid <coughs> review of a bunch of different topics, just a little brief summary of each of basically all of the preventative care that um, should at some point in time be discussed uh, you know, with your primary care doctor. So we'll kind of go over each topic and, and yes, sir. Could you talk up? Sure. Uh, <coughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Is that better? That's better. Okay. So um, just kind of kind of go through several different topics and try to run through each of them and kind of what the standard guidelines are as to when they should be addressed and how and so forth and so on. So uh, this is a little bit of my background. Uh, so I did college at LSU in Baton Rouge, uh, medical school and the rest of my medical training in Treeport. Um, my, by training, I'm actually med ped so internal medicine and pediatrics, but you know, obviously upstairs in the internal medicine clinic, we, we do just adult medicine. Uh, and then some of my affiliations, the AMA, the American College of Physicians, and then uh, the AAP as well. So this is a list of, uh, part of the list of topics we'll discuss. So uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, aspirin use in adults for primary prevention, breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, colorectal uh, cancer screening, diabetes, hypertension, uh, high cholesterol, lung cancer, prostate cancer, osteoporosis screening, uh, sexually transmitted infections and their screening, and then um, Last but not least, uh, you know, adult vaccines or immunizations. <clears throat> so uh, we'll just kind of, uh, let me mention this as well. Uh, so all of the recommendations in the talk are, are from uh, basically one of these three governing bodies. Uh, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, uh, the American Cancer Society, or the CDC. I think most people have probably heard of or are or, uh, familiar with the uh, American Cancer Society or the CDC. Uh, the USPSTF uh, may be less so. It's basically what it is. It's a, a group of primary care providers uh, that are federally appointed and it also includes uh, uh, some members from the nursing fields as well. So by primary care they mean uh, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, um, OBGYN doctors, those are kind of the four main ones off the top of my head that, you know, would include and constitute primary care providers. So <clears throat> it could be, I think it's a group of about 12, 15, 20 individuals and appointed from those, uh, those fields. So, and most of the recommendations throughout the talk are from the USPSTF. There's a couple topics where they differ and it's a little bit controversial based on the topic with say either the American Cancer Society um, and I'll discuss both sets of recommendations just to be as comprehensive as possible. Uh, so <clears throat> not all recommendations are, uh, it's not black and white like a yes or a no. There's, there's different levels or grades of recommendations and they're uh, by letter, so grade A, B, C, D, and there's actually a grade I as well. Grade A and grade B are basically the top recommendations, meaning that they recommend these things be done at this a at that age, um, and there's at least a high or moderate certainty that there is the benefit of doing the screening test outweighs the risk of whatever could happen as a result of the test. Grade C is kind of of an in-between category. It's basically on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and what that ultimately means is it comes down to a discussion between you and your provider at a visit uh, based on what your preferences are and uh, based on you know, their medical judgment and, and what they think as part of um, would best be based on your medical history or family history and so forth and so on. Grade D is, uh, according to the USPSTF, uh, they recommend these tests not be done. So anything that's a grade D, they would recommend against that. And then there is, you'll see a couple of them scattered throughout the talk, there's a grade I, which basically means there's insufficient evidence to either recommend for or against whatever the topic is. 
So we'll go ahead and get right into it. Uh, the first one uh, category is uh, triple A's or abdominal aortic aneurysms. The recommendations by the USPSTF for this are that there be a one-time screening done for all males uh, done by ultrasound method uh, between the ages of 65 and 75 if they've ever smoked. Okay, so for all male smokers, 65 to 75 should have a one-time ultrasound done to screen out for abdominal aortic aneurysms. <coughs> the, uh, just for whoever is not familiar, the, the aorta is the big blood vessel that comes off the, off the heart and runs down the center of the chest and down through the uh, abdomen as well and kind of is the main blood supply for all the um, respective arteries after it to deliver blood to out all the tissues of the body. So this is uh, people can get aneurysms of that big blood vessel just like people can have brain aneurysms or an aneurysm anywhere else. So this is a grade B recommendation so this would be a recommendation that they would would recommend be done. Uh, this is a grade C recommendation. They recommend neither for nor against uh, AAA screening in men who have never smoked. So between the ages of 65 and 75 who have never smoked. So that would basically ultimately come down to be, uh, be between the patient and their provider as to whether or not to do this. And then for women, it's actually a grade D recommendation. They, they make no recommendation and actually recommend against uh, screening for triple A's in women. Uh, so aspirin use for primary prevention. This is in regards to either strokes or heart attacks. Um, primary prevention meaning before you ever have either a stroke or a heart attack. Uh, so the first one, uh, USPS, USPSTF recommends for the use of aspirin for men starting at age 45 up to age 79 is where the recommendation goes through um, <clears throat> a baby aspirin every day for the prevention of myocardial infarctions or heart attacks um, if the benefit outweighs the potential harm of an increased risk of uh, bleeding in the stomach or the intestines. This is a grade A recommendation. So basically all men age 45 to 79 should take a baby aspirin every day unless it's otherwise contraindicated. So they have an allergy to aspirin or um, an active stomach ulcer that's prone to bleeding and so forth and so on. So that's a grade A recommendation. Uh, also a grade A recommendation, this is the same thing. So for aspirin use for primary prevention, this is in women starting at age 55 up to age 79. This is for the primary prevention of ischemic strokes. So for a different reason and a little bit different age, but uh, for the use of aspirin use in, in women. So 55 to 79 for prevention of ischemic strokes. Um, also a grade A recommendation. Uh, they, baby aspirin, too. baby aspirin, yes ma'am, the 81 milligram aspirin. Yes ma'am. <clears throat> So this is a, one of the ones that I was referring to, the grade I recommendation that, so they don't uh, basically say there's not enough evidence to, to support either for or against this. Um, insufficient evidence to assess the balance of benefits and harms of aspirin for cardiovascular disease prevention in men and women over the age of 80 years old. Now this is, once again, just for primary prevention. So someone who's 80 or above who's never had a stroke or a heart attack. Yes, ma'am. Why is the, um, the, the men and the women, it's for different things? That is, uh, that's just the way that the, the recommendation is written up, the, the way that presumably the study was done. Um, heart attacks for men and strokes for women. Right, right. They, they, would, they would go hand in hand. Um, as for like once we get to like looking at high cholesterol and whether you should be on cholesterol medicine or not and that sort of thing, which we won't get too much into, um, they're lumped together as far as uh, what's called atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. That would include strokes and heart attacks. Um, but for primary prevention use of aspirin, that's just, that's basically what they say where the intention is to prevent um, in the respective gender. Uh, 
Um, lastly, they recommend, this is a great D recommendation, they actually recommend against the use of aspirin before the respective ages for either women or men. So before 55 for women or 45 for men. And once again, this is for primary prevention. So someone who's had either a stroke or a heart attack before that age, the, the recommendation changes. So uh, breast cancer screening. So <clears throat> this is one where the USPSTF and the American Cancer Society differ in a little bit on the frequency of screening and the ages at which to start or end. So uh, the first slide will be the USPSTF and then we'll, we'll move on. So they recommend uh, screening every other year, uh, screening mammography or mammograms for women ages 50 to 74. This is a grade B recommendation. Uh, the decision to start regular screening every other year with mammograms before the age of 50 uh, should basically be a discussion between the patient and their provider based on their past history or family history, more commonly is the issue. Um, and then the patient's feelings, you know, how strongly they feel about starting mammograms before the age of 50 or not. So grade C. And then it's a grade I recommendation, so uh, they, they make no recommendation one way or the other. There's no evidence to support it or, um, or go against it uh, for screening with mammograms after the age of 75. So this changes a little bit in an individual who has had breast cancer. This is, once again, for, for, for primary prevention. So um, it may would be different in someone who's had a history of breast cancer in the past and seeing their oncologist and they continue to get mammograms. So um, just keep that in mind for all of these. So. And that was all basically the United uh, States Preventative Services Task Force. So we'll get a little bit into um, what the American Cancer Society uh, recommends in, in this slide. So they, uh, USPSTF actually recommends against uh, teaching self-breast exams. It's a grade D recommendation, so they don't recommend doing that. Um, they basically say that there's insufficient evidence to determine whether it's beneficial to do clinical breast exams. So breast exams done actually in the office. Um, beyond just doing the routine mammograms uh, in women over the age of 40. And this is going to differ a little bit between the American Cancer Society. Uh, and they, uh, this is uh, getting into a little bit more specialized mammography, either digital mammography, or they can actually do MRIs um, for breast uh, screening, breast cancer screening. And this is basically to say that uh, there's insufficient evidence for them to make a recommendation in regards to those little bit advanced or newer tests as opposed to just the old fashioned mammography. Okay, it should be this slide that we get into the American Cancer Society recommendations. So <clears throat> the American Cancer Society, uh, they say that Self-breast exams by the patient are optional over the age of 20. Clinical breast exams should be performed, uh, so this is by the provider in clinic. Um, they say every three years between the ages of 20 and 39 and should be done annually over the age of 40. Uh, and this is a little bit different as far as mammograms and the ages and the frequency. So American Cancer Society recommends Mammograms are optional from the ages of 40 to 44. They recommend they be done annually between 45 and 54, and then every other year for 55 and over. Uh, they don't make any recommendation as to when to stop them as far as a specific age, but as long as at least a 10-year life expectancy is reasonably anticipated for the patient, they recommend that mammograms would continue. This is a little bit more in depth. Um, this is for women with uh, either positive uh, family history or different other risk factors. Um, as far in regards to uh, genetic counseling um, 
and uh, BRCA testing, which is basically there's a couple different BRCA genes that are uh, linked to, to breast cancer. Um, so breast cancer, um, different female cancers that run in families and women who have had BRCA testing in the past. And this is some of the recommendations uh, in regards to that. And most of these are somewhat vague and kind of left up between the patient or their family members um, if they're involved and then uh, their oncologist or the genetic counselor that's involved in, in their care. Uh, some of the risk factors are uh, a diagnosis of breast cancer before the age of 50, bilateral breast cancer, uh, family history of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, uh, presence of breast cancer in one ma at least one male family member or multiple cases in the family, um, and then greater than or at least one or more family members with two primary types of BRCA-related uh, malignancies or Ashkenazi Jew ethnicity. So that's, that's a little bit more involved and kind of a little bit more looking into sort of thing. Uh, typically there's, uh, at that point, there's a family history, obviously, and an oncologist is involved. A lot of times genetic counselors. And um, so that's a little bit more in depth as far as, and, and they're usually involved and kind of kind of make recommendations for uh, family members involved. Uh, cervical cancer screening. Uh, this is the USPSTF's recommendation for uh, women to have uh, pap smears starting to be done at the age of 21 up through the age of 25. Um, so for women up to, so 21 to 30, uh, they can be done every three years. Women ages 30 to 65 can continue to be done every three years or they can be done every five years if a special type of other testing uh, is done for uh, the HPV uh, human papillomavirus. Um, if pap smears are negative and the HPV testing is negative, the, the frequency of um, the screening can be uh, lengthened out to every five years, actually. And this is mainly because uh, the HPV virus has been so strongly linked to cases of cervical cancer and um, dysplasia found on pap smears and, and additional tests needed to be done. So <clears throat> that's why they uh, basically re make a recommendation that the, the frequency of them can be, you know, lengthened out to an extra couple years to every five years if, if testing is negative. Now this is for women who have basically had negative pap smears up through this. If they've ever had an abnormal one or had, had to have additional invasive testing done, a colposcopy and biopsies and those, so, those sort of things, um, these things, you know, kind of change and the frequency changes. This is a grade A recommendation. So they make no recommendation to start pap smears before the age of 21, um, except in a very few small specific circumstances. But uh, basically, you know, women before the age, or young adult uh, women before the age of 21 uh, don't, typically don't need to have pap smears done. And this has kind of changed over recent years. Uh, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, this was, this was a diff you know, different case. They started them before this age. Uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, so the USPSTF recommends screening with, uh, screening for colorectal cancer using fecal occult blood testing. So these are the stool cards that uh, some people may be familiar with that they take home and put a specimen on several different cards and then bring them back to the lab and basically testing for blood in the stool. Uh, sigmoidoscopy, which is uh, similar to a colonoscopy except it doesn't, uh, uh, the GI doctor or surgeon or whichever provider is performing the procedure won't actually visualize the entire colon. Uh, a full colonoscopy um, and those are the basically the three different methods discussed as far as screening. Uh, starting at the age of 50, uh, continuing to the age of 75, um, and then it basically dis discusses how the risks and benefits of these screening methods vary. A couple of which are invasive procedures, so are obviously more risk involved. The fecal occult blood testing, and, yes sir? Are you saying, or is this saying that after 75 you should not 
I'm going to get into that. So uh, it, it, that kind of becomes between the ages of, uh, I think it says 75 and 85 here in a second. Let's see if it's my next point. Actually, it is. Yes, sir. Um, so it's basically, this is a grade C recommendation. So it becomes a discussion between you and your provider. Now, whether that's your primary care doctor, if you've already had colonoscopies through a, a gastroenterology doctor or stomach doctor, um, kind of of a discussion between y'all and, and say, it's kind of similar to the breast cancer screening uh, as far as the recommendations are by the American Cancer Society. If there's a, if someone is very healthy and there's a, you know, a reasonable, reasonably long life expectancy anticipated, more than 10 years, it might be worth doing another colonoscopy um, between these ages. Um, especially if they've found certain things on previous ones, a few polyps here and there and sort of thing, and, and may want to do another one. So if the benefit of the procedure outweighs the risk, then it, it'd be reasonable to, to have another one done. People who are fairly ill on a lot of medicines, um, higher chances of them having an adverse reaction or something happening during the procedure, it may not be worth having another colonoscopy done at this age. So that's why they make a grade C recommendation here and, and you know, basically leave it to you and your provider. Uh, they recommend against screening over the age of 85. So it's a grade D recommendation. Um, this is uh, similar to the uh, uh, like we talked about with breast cancer screening and the uh, MRI test or uh, the fancier mammography, digital mammography. Uh, this is in relation to uh, CT imaging uh, of the colon for screening of uh, colon cancer. Um, so according to the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, they basically say there's insufficient evidence to either support this or, or go against this. So. Uh, as far as intervals, uh, colorectal cancer screening, uh, annual screening would be done if the cards were used, so the fecal occult blood testing cards. Um, if a sigmoidoscopy is done, it, say every five years, uh, along with uh, high intensity fecal occult blood testing, so the cards every three years. Uh, if colonoscopy is done, they recommend it be done every 10 years. Now this is if it's completely normal. Uh, depending on what the uh, providers performing the procedure, depending on what they find, they may repeat colonoscopies every five years, every three years. It, it all depends on what they find. If it's completely normal, then it's reasonable to do it every 10 years, as far as the colonoscopy is concerned. Uh, moving on to diabetes. So this actually comes from the American Diabetes Association. Uh, they recommend screening um, for diabetes in all adults uh, at or beyond the age of 45, um, even if they don't have any risk factors. Uh, risk factors being obesity, family history of diabetes, and you know, along with others. Um, they also recommend testing for diabetes in adults uh, who are overweight or obese, so BMI over 25, uh, and have one or more additional risk factors for diabetes. So, like I mentioned, one of them being uh, like a family history of diabetes. Uh, the USPSTF also recommends targeted screening for diabetes uh, in individuals with a sustained blood pressure over 135 over 80. That's millimeters of mercury, obviously. So for high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, the optimal interval of screening uh, for high blood pressure is not necessarily known. Um, generally, every time someone uh, goes to a doctor's appointment, they typically get their blood pressure checked, especially with their primary care doctor. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, to make a recommendation, they stated that it should be, uh, people should be screened for it every two years, at least, if their blood pressure is uh, completely normal. So SBP being a systolic blood pressure and DBP diastolic blood pressure. So systolic is the top number, diastolic is the bottom number. Uh, so if it's normal, meaning 120 over 80 or less, then can be screened every two years. Um, 
if they're in the pre-hypertension range, which we'll get into in just a second, 120 to 139 over 80 to 89, then it should be screened every, every year or annually. Uh, screening starts in adulthood at age 18. These are the definitions for hypertension, uh, normal pre-hypertension, stage one, stage two. So normal, 120 over 80 or less, pre-hypertension, 120 to 139 over 80 to 89. Stage 1 hypertension, 140 to 159 over 90 to 99. Stage 2, greater than 160 over 100. Uh, high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia. Uh, should start uh, in early adulthood, age 17 to 21. <clears throat> undergo a one-time screening of uh, non-high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. So HDL is... Uh, commonly referred to as our good cholesterol, LDL is bad cholesterol. So basically screening of bad cholesterol is what this is referring to. Uh, individuals uh, at higher risk of family history, obesity, um, suggest uh, screening for abnormalities start at age 25 for men, 35 for women. This is after the initial screening listed above. And then if it's normal before 21, then it can start at 35 for men, 45 for women. Uh, lung cancer screening. This is a relatively new recommendation in the last couple years. Um, so they recommend that uh, for smokers uh, with at least a 30 pack year history of smoking um, and who have smoked at some point in time within the past 15 years get a annual low-dose CAT scan or CT scan of the chest done uh, to screen for uh, lung cancer. Uh, so 30 pack year history meaning if you smoke a pack a day and had done it for 30 years that's a 30 pack year history. Uh, if you smoke two packs a day it would only take 15 years to get a 30 pack year history so easy math to kind of decide uh, you know their average pack year history. Uh, this screening starts at age 55 and goes up through the age of 80. So an annual low-dose CAT scan, uh, screening for lung cancer in smokers. Prostate cancer screening. This is a little bit of a controversial topic uh, just because the United States uh, Preventative Services Task Force and the um, uh, Urology Association, American Urology Association, uh, differ quite a bit as to what they recommend be done. So the USPSTF actually recommends against PSA-based prostate cancer screening. PSA being the uh, blood test for uh, uh, prostate screening. So it's a grade D recommendation. They recommend against it. Uh, the American Cancer Society is also included here. They uh, and they they differ a little bit as well. Uh, they basically say in men uh, 45 and up at high risk uh, with at least a 10-year life expectancy or ages 50 and up with average risk be screened. And it'd be a discussion. Uh, so, yes sir? Uh, are they saying the PSA is just a, an unnecessary test? Are they saying that it has some uh, derogatory effect? The US Preventative Services Task Force? Is that yeah. what you're referring to? The they, uh, they basically, <clears throat> as best I understand, make their recommendation against it because um, depending on what your value is, people may get referrals to specialists, to like a urologist, uh, get biopsies done, get uh, invasive imaging, ultrasound procedures done, uh, those sort of things done, and it may not be necessary, um, meaning the testing can sometimes come back negative. The, uh, their feeling on the PSA is that maybe it's not a great test for a screening procedure, uh, meaning your PSA could be elevated for reasons not related to prostate cancer. Um, uh, men can have an infection of their prostate, acute prostatitis, that can cause uh, elevation of the PSA. Uh, BPH in men can cause, which is a common condition in men, an enlarged prostate, not necessarily cancer, can cause an elevation of the PSA. So I think that that's why they make their recommendation against PSA-based screening for, for prostate, specifically for prostate cancer. 
Yes, sir. They tried it. I think they tried to do it on a cost-benefit analysis. Right. And if the downstream costs exceed a certain amount, they will. Don't want to be looking for something mm -hmm. that could save lives, but it costs them more downstream. Right. Whereas the PSA is the most efficacious and the easiest and test to do at your PCP mm -hmm. and it, as you said if you have a UTI or BPH or any other mm -hmm. symptom that may mm -hmm. raise your or having sex the night before will raise your <laughs> PSA you need to know about it and monitor it. It's right. not a one type test where you test it once. It's how your body does over a many year period. Exactly. And monitoring that is exceptionally important irregardless of what the uh, talking heads say from the government. Right. That's, that's <coughs> you basically got into what my next slide is going to address. And that's part of what the uh, American Urology Association's recommendations are based on. Um, but that's another good point that I didn't mention in the beginning. All of these are screening tests. So the, the best screening test is, is one that doesn't cost a whole lot because it's, it's generic screen for everyone. So it should be a relatively inexpensive test that should be pretty sensitive and specific, meaning not miss a whole lot of cases of, of what you're screening for. So um, that's another reason um, or another way that they base what their recommendations are. It, it does, cost does come into consideration, definitely. What's the early symptoms of, of the prostate? So um, symptoms that men will have, mostly genital urinary symptoms, uh, urinary frequency, um, getting up a lot at night to urinate. Now these aren't necessarily specific for prostate cancer. They could be indicative of an enlarged prostate or BPH. Um, so the symptoms aren't necessarily specific. Uh, it could be symptoms of a urinary tract infection as, as well. So. Um, they're not specific either, but th those are, are the typical symptoms that men will experience. Um, okay, so basically back to um, between the American Cancer Society, a discussion uh, with your patients about PSAs between the ages of 50 and 69, so 50 to 70. Uh, now a, a slide for uh, the American Urology Association and their recommendations. Uh, like I alluded to earlier, they disagree with the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force uh, regarding prostate cancer screening. Uh, they do acknowledge that a single PSA value is difficult to interpret and, and not always terribly useful like we mentioned earlier. Uh, they think that it should be uh, taken in context based on the patient's history, symptoms, what exactly is going on in their specific case. and that the decision to perform uh, an invasive procedure like a biopsy uh, should be based on other things as well, not just the uh, PSA value. So DRA or digital rectal exam, a prostate exam, um, patient's age, their ethnicity, their, uh, their own medical history, their family history with regards to prostate cancer. So all of these other things should be taken into consideration before additional testing is considered for an elevated PSA. Yes, ma'am. But if they have, but if a man has it done every year, and they they, it's not not a single one, but every year, I know at least I know three men that they did, uh, discovered prostate cancer as a result of having right it every year right, so how can and they recommend not to do it. The American Urology Association does recommend that it be done. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends against it. Um, that's, that's one th other thing that they, they mentioned, the uh, PSA trend or PSA velocity, meaning the, um, the, how rapidly it increases over time, if it is increasing or changing over time. Uh, 
the AUA recommends that that be taken into consideration as far as whether or not a biopsy should be performed and so forth and so on. But couldn't the same thing be said for mammographies? You're exposing sensitive breast tissue to radiation on a regular basis. If you have dense breasts and fibrocystic, you're going to end up doing an ultrasound, right. do subsequent procedures. So there's no difference. In the efficacy, as a matter of fact, probably the mammography does more harm. It definitely does in the PSA if you put them in comparison. Well, that's why the ages are what they are, and they don't necessarily recommend starting mammograms um, at age 40 or before age 40. Um, or don't necessarily recommend doing them annually and maybe me recommend doing them every other year. Um, all of these things go into mm -hmm. these different governing bodies deciding what their recommendations are. And, and I mean, uh, just all of the discussion, it's, you know, uh, starting here, you could see why they differ be, between their recommendations and why, um, why the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, for some of the things that um, are less evidence-based as far as the benefit, uh, a lot of those things are grade C recommendations, meaning it'd be on a case-by-case -case basis between the patient and their provider based on their history, their risk, and, and the provider's uh, medical judgment. And uh, certainly the PSA uh, in prostate cancer um, of all the topics is uh, discussed is, is probably the most controversial because there's the most difference between their recommendations. Uh, uh, one group recommends completely against it, the other group recommends completely for it. Whereas the other topics, you know, they may differ a little bit on age or frequency of screening, but are pretty universal as to whether or not they recommend for or against it. Yes, sir. Well, if a, if a good urologist recommends you have a PSA, and, it, and it, maybe it runs a little high, He's not going to run you in for a, a, a biopsy or anything like that right off the bat. Mm -hmm. He's going to wait a while and, and, and have you come back within a certain period of time and check it again. Right. You know. Well, and they, that's, you know, that's the second, but they, they, you know, acknowledge that a single one is, is not, you know, is difficult to interpret. And they would argue that uh, you could look at their website, the AUA's website. They would argue that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force doesn't have a urologist on the committee. It's a group of primary care doctors. And I'm not saying one is wrong or right. I'm just basically presenting what each of their recommendations are. So that, yeah, I kind of leave it at that. But certainly, certainly prostate cancer screening is, uh, is fairly controversial between the two groups. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has, has been around for a while. I, I can't say, I think it was in the 1980s. So uh, this is uh, a group that has, has been established and, and, you know, making these sorts of recommendations for a long time. And they've obviously changed over time. So it's not something that's recently started within the last couple years or, you know, that sort of thing with all the changes in health care. This is... Uh, we actually already got into all of this, but uh, the PSA velocity, meaning the PSA trend over time, how it changes over time, that should be another variable that the uh, group of urologists actually obviously put a lot of stock into and, and uh, as far as making medical decisions as to whether or not biopsies should be done or not done and it just monitored. So that's uh, probably one of the, the big ones that they, um, one of the biggest variables that they, they put a lot of influence on, as well as the patient's age, and, and like I mentioned earlier, there are other risk factors. Okay, uh, next topic, osteoporosis screening. Uh, so these are DEXA scans or bone density scans. Um, the recommendation for this is in women uh, at or older than the age of 65, um, if not previously done at 65. Uh, postmenopausal women under the age of 65 with clinical risk factors for fractures. Um, and that'll be on the next slide. For men, um, uh, bone density scans can be done as well if they have uh, any of these factors. So uh, osteopenia, or you can think of it as weak bones on x-rays. 
a uh, history of a fragility fracture. So this is um, a fracture that basically occurs from a standing height. So not someone who fell 10 feet off a ladder and broke something, someone who just fell from standing and, and broke a bone. So basically uh, um, a mild fall and then a, you know, a significant fracture sustained as, as a result of that fall. Uh, loss of more than 1.5 inches in height uh, and other risk factors. So these are kind of the other risk factors. Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta um, are both risk factors. Uh, hormone abnormalities, um, hyperthyroidism, hyper hyperparathyroid, hypogonadism, uh, malabsorption conditions, so celiac disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, meaning Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, uh, vitamin D deficiency, uh, alcoholism, chronic liver or kidney disease. And then certain medications can make people more susceptible to osteoporosis. Uh, steroids are certainly a big one. Uh, heparin chemotherapy, um, Depo-Provera, and uh, seizure medications, uh, certain ones, not necessarily all of them. Sexually transmitted infections. Uh, so I'll just run through them real quick. Uh, most of them are in relation to, uh, are categorized based on either pregnant or non-pregnant individuals. Uh, most of which are all recommended for uh, pregnant women. Syphilis, so at-risk non-pregnant patients and all pregnant patients. Uh, HIV, the CD, this is a CDC recommendation. So all individuals between the ages of 15 and 65 um, at some point, one time or another, should have uh, a HIV test, screening for HIV, and then all pregnant women. Uh, hepatitis, uh, all pregnant patients, that's more specifically hepatitis B, and then at-risk non-pregnant individuals. Uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea, sexually active women uh, younger than age 25, and women older than that age at risk for sexually transmitted infections. Like I said, gonorrhea is essentially the same as chlamydia for recommendations. Uh, now we're gonna move on to uh, vaccines or adult immunizations uh, and just kind of run through most of them. Uh, so first of all, a couple slides on uh, why to give vaccines, uh, why to uh, vaccinate people. Uh, the big reason is they work, and the next slide will kind of have a figure to demonstrate that. Uh, the side effects are, are, are very mild, um, so the benefit of the vaccines largely outweigh the risk. Um, and then herd protection, which uh, basically means if the vast majority of individuals get vaccinated, even if there's a small minority that don't, odds are that they're protected from the respective disease because everybody around them is protected from it. So the odds of them getting it is slim to none. Um, so this is kind of uh, 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 image uh, on vaccines. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to see. The, the first picture, the big bubbles, is in 19, the early 1900s. And then the second picture is now, this is a couple years old. So 2010 is when the data was taken. And the respective colors and the uh, correlate with the different uh, different diseases. So, measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis, uh, diphtheria, polio, um, tetanus. All of these are included uh, on here. And you can see, uh, obviously, the the size of the bubbles is drastically different um, over just a hundred years. So, um, so that this you know would kind of be demonstration of, of how well vaccines work. And um, the other thing to think about is, uh, you know, nowadays, um, you know, does anyone know anyone who has polio now or has recently gotten polio or some of these other uh, diseases that we have vaccines for that have, you know, essentially been eradicated, so. So into, uh, the vaccines one at a time. Now, uh, childhood vaccines aren't, aren't included uh, on here as far as the um, recommendations for kids. Uh, so this is basically just the adult recommendations included in the slides. So the influenza or the flu vaccine, uh, annual vaccination against flu is recommended 
uh, all, indiv all individuals ages six months of age and older. Um, six months and older, including pregnant women, can receive the injectable flu vaccine. Uh, pregnant women should specifically receive the vaccine because their infant can't get the flu vaccine until the age of six months. So for the first six months of life, they're you know, susceptible and at risk for flu. Flu season is generally October through March. Uh, healthy non-pregnant adults younger than the age of 50, this is in regards to the intranasal flu vaccine, which um, I'm not so sure whether it's actually offered this year, but in, in recent years that they were giving the intranasal flu vaccine as long as individuals didn't have a contraindication to it between the ages of two and 50. So this may be not necessarily relevant since it's not offered this year. Healthcare personnel uh, who care for severely immunocompromised persons should receive the injectable vaccine rather than the flu mist or the intranasal. Some of these may be a little irrelevant. The, the main point of this slide is that the, the intranasal vaccine was a, actually a live attenuated vaccine. Means it was a live vaccine, whereas the injectable version of the flu vaccine is, is not live virus. So it, it can't give you the flu, um, which is you know, a common misconception. Uh, adults 65 years and older can receive the standard dose flu vaccine. There is another version of what's called the high dose flu vaccine, uh, the flu zone high dose. So that is available for individuals uh, 65 and older. Uh, tetanus, diphtheria, uh, acellular pertussis, the Tdap. Uh, these are mostly, uh, has the recommendations for the tetanus vaccine, tetanus booster. Uh, but more specifically for the Tdap version of the vaccine, which includes uh, pertussis vaccine with it, or whooping cough vaccine. So the Tdap booster is given every 10 years. Uh, most people are familiar with this. If they cut themselves, have a laceration, have to go to the ER. If, if there's any question as to when your last tetanus shot was, typically they give it to you in the ER. Uh, a one-time Tdap for all adults to replace one dose of the just regular tetanus uh, is recommended. It's specifically indicated for women, uh, pregnant women, uh, in their third trimester. Uh, it, it, it's helpful with a cocooning effect, and I'll explain that in a moment, and uh, for specifically for healthcare personnel. The, the recommendation for pregnant women in the third trimester of pregnancy is if they get the Tdap vaccine. These are for the Tdap version of the vaccine. So specifically the, uh, to the one that includes uh, pertussis vaccine or whooping cough. Um, if women get it in their third trimester of pregnancy, their immune system will generate uh, antibodies or an immune defense to uh, pertussis. And by way of the placenta will pass it on to the infant by way of passive immunity. Uh, infants don't start getting their first set of vaccines till two months of age. So for those first couple months, they're susceptible to some of these illnesses, specifically uh, whooping cough and, and can get very sick from it. Um, the Tdap version can be administered earlier than 10 years than what the, the, the booster would be recommended. Um, and pregnant women should be vaccinated with every pregnancy because of the passive immunity. Now the cocooning effect is um, similar to herd uh, protection like mentioned in an earlier slide. If all of the adults, so dad, grandparents, um, uh, daycare workers, all of the adults in close proximity with, with young babies, infants, uh, specifically less than one year of age, but certainly the younger they are, the more susceptible they are to pertussis. Uh, if all of those individuals get vaccinated against pertussis, then it creates a cocoon effect around the infant, which protects them until they're able to get their two-month-old vaccines, their four-month and their six-month-old vaccines, all of which the Tdap is included. Um, actually, their version for kids is a DTAP, but it, either way, the pertussis vaccine is included in their, their routine vaccinations at those ages. Varicella or the chickenpox vaccine, they um, now have this for kids. It's recommended at age one and then again at age four for their booster. It's a two dose vaccine. Um, there are recommendations for adults who haven't been previously immunized or not considered to have evidence of immunity as 
by evidence of the uh, last bullet. Uh, it, this one is a live vaccine, so the main concern is it's not recommended for immunocompromised adults, so individuals with the malignancy undergoing uh, chemotherapy treatments, uh, this, this would not be a recommended vaccine. The other case where we have to be careful is individuals who are going to be in close contact with young infants before they've received their chickenpox vaccine, their varicella vaccine, because it is a live vaccine. Evidence of immunity, um, documentation of the two-dose vaccine previously, so you know nowadays in childhood, uh, U.S. born prior to 1980, except healthcare and workers and pregnancy, uh, history of varicella or zoster infection, uh, or laboratory evidence of immunity, so a provider can check your titers against the disease and, and see if you have uh, an active immunity against it. Uh, shingles or zoster vaccine uh, related to the chickenpox vaccine, same, same virus. So uh, CDC recommends a single dose of the vaccine um, after the age of 60 in all individuals unless it's contraindicated. So once again, it's a live vaccine. So that's the main contraindications, individuals who are immunocompromised. Uh, individuals who are taking antiviral medications for shingles um, or some other condition should, should not be given the vaccine, may not work as well. Um, and it should be avoid, uh, individuals who receive it should avoid close contacts with infants or young ones, like younger than one year of age um, for the reasons of it being a live vaccine. Yes, sir. I had shingles about two years ago and uh, I'll still get pain. Mm -hmm. I can expect that for the rest of my life. That, it's possible. That can be a common long-term manifestation. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, those who have ha had infections with shingles before, the vaccine is still recommended for those individuals, just not during the active infection, during the outbreak. It says in the light, you should wait till all the lesions cross over. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, it's, that's saying that if you get the vaccine, you might still get some lesions? No, ma'am. The last one is um, is specifically with regards to those with a, I need to clarify that with an active infection oh, okay. should avoid contact with yeah because it can be transmitted. And you can pass chickenpox if you have shingles to a child who has not been vaccinated and they will get the chickenpox. Right. That's specifically what the last last bullet is in reference to to avoid contact with those who have not been vaccinated yet. So all kids less, less than one year of age because they can't receive the vaccine until their one year old visit. Question, Dr. Greenman. Um, I saw, well, I saw a commercial. One in three individuals will receive the shingles if you've had the chicken pox. So is it saying this, um, taking, I mean, I'm sorry, having the vaccine that will prevent Mm -hmm. That one from three, does it cancel mm -hmm. it out, or how does that work? People who have had the vaccine can still have shingles. Typically, it's much less severe if they do have shingles after having received the vaccine. Um, but it is certainly, po it's not 100% effective, but um, it certainly does reduce the risk of having shingles. And for those who do have it, typically have a much less severe case. If you never had chicken pox, you would still, it's still recommended. Mm -hmm. the, the reason for some of that is if you go back to, um, I don't know if the, there's a light on here. Yeah, the light on here. Um, the evidence of having immunity to it is it's pretty specific. Um, most of us who have had chicken pox or had or didn't have chicken pox or don't know whether we had chicken pox, it was so long ago. And a lot, right, no, I understand. There are, other, there are other viruses that have rashes and, and sometimes they look similar and, and there's a, um, a lot of overlap and, and it's not necessarily perfectly documented as to whether it was specifically chickenpox or not. And so that's why they make the recommendation the way that they do. And these recommendations, um, these, these recommendations all come from the CDC. This is not the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. So all the vaccine recommendations are straight from the uh, Center for Disease Control. And that's specifically why they make their recommendation that way. 
Uh, the HPV vaccine, uh, human papillomavirus, the vaccine, uh, one version of the vaccine is uh, called Gardasil. So we uh, mentioned HPV earlier when we, we talked a little bit about cervical cancer. It's a three dose vaccine series. It's recommended for uh, teenagers, both males and females, starting at the age of 11 up through the age of 26. The reason that the, um, at least as best I understand, the reason that the vaccine start, stops at 26 is that is the age group that the study was done in. So it's not necessarily that it's not safe for older individuals, but this is, this is how the recommendation stands, um, that it, the three-dose vaccine be given um, in between these ages. Uh, so it's recommended for males and females. It's not a live vaccine. Uh, it's prevention of, for the prevention of cervical cancer, penile cancers, head and neck cancers, anal cancer, and genital warts. There's different strains or serotypes of HPV. Certain ones are high risk, meaning they're, li risk, they're linked to the, some of these malignancies, other of which are more specifically linked to the warts. So that would be the difference between the high risk versus the ones that aren't considered high risk. Uh, pneumococcal vaccine, there's, there's uh, two versions of it, so we'll go through each of them and the specific indications for each. Um, they are the Prevnar vaccine and the Pneumovax vaccine, probably uh, if anyone has seen commercials in the last six months to a year. Most of those are referring to the Prevnar vaccine, and that's because it's a relatively new recommendation over recent years for um, adults. So two versions, uh, both versions should be given to everyone at or beyond age 65 at separate visits, uh, regardless of medical history. The Prevnar vaccine is, is for adults older than 18. This is part of the uh, vaccine series that we give to children as well, but as with regards to adult recommendations, adults older than 18 with specific conditions. So immunocompromising conditions, um, asplenia, those uh, who either have had their spleen removed for trauma reasons, uh, certain times individuals are in a car wreck and have bad enough injuries to where their, their spleen has to be removed. Um, certain individuals are considered fun functionally asplenic. So the most common condition being sickle cell, over time their spleen infarcts and, and becomes where it's not active and not functioning properly. So they would be considered asplenic as well. Um, so this is anatomic or functional asplenia. <coughs> CSF leaks, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and cochlear implants. And these are kind of more very specific conditions. Um, now, me, yes ma'am. You would know if you had one of these, basically. Um, Immunocompr- so either of these three you would know if you had it. Um, immunocompromising conditions, uh, the most common thing or common example being um, having a documented or, or history of a malignancy and undergoing like chemotherapy treatments with an oncologist. That's the most common thing that's considered immunocompromised. These are both safe for immunocompromised individuals. They're not live vaccines. So they would be safe for immunocompromised individuals. And why it's specifically recommended for immunocompromised individuals. Um, for these individuals who are immunocompromised, they should get the Prevnar first, and then it's okay to vaccinate them with the Pneumovax eight weeks later, if never vaccinated before. Uh, the Pneumovax uh, is recommended for all previously mentioned individuals, so on this slide, all of these individuals, and, and that's included in this point, how it's recommended for them. It's also recommended for um, diabetics, smokers, individuals with chronic lung disease, uh, chronic liver disease. Pneumovax individuals can be revaccinated after five years. And that's it. So these are specifically individuals between the ages of 18 and 64. So remember, both versions are recommended for all individuals older than 65 at separate visits. So this is all in relation to younger adults, basically. Younger than 65. 
And that's all that I have, <laughs> which is a lot. <laughs> any other questions, specifically with any, uh, in regards to any specific topic?